Mike Murray. This is SNL. 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 By the numbers. 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 Feel the Kennedy. Papyrus 2, cut for time. Let's try not to break. <laughs> There's the opening haiku for you. Welcome to SNL by the Numbers, the home of SNL Stats. We are covering episode 965, hosted by Ryan Gosling, musical guest Chris Stapleton. I am your host, Mike Murray of the SNN. We are a presentation of LateNighter.com. Have two great guests on with me, first of which I just met a couple weeks ago. We had a great time. Talked about a lot of music theory. She has the best mic in the biz. <laughs> Gabby Forbes Bennett, welcome to By the Numbers. What's up? Hey, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my first time doing this this podcast. Super stoked. I am like basically allergic to numbers, but I can digest these SNL ones. Um, so very excited to get into it. <laughs> Yeah, I get that a lot. You know, people that are big sports fans or not sports fans at all, but whether they like math or not, when it's SNL related, it's for them. So happy to have the Queen of Queens with me and <laughs> back again. Uh, healthy this time. It's Amanda Ooh. Barkin. She was doing a Rebecca North impression last time <laughs> she was here and it was it was killing. So welcome yeah. back. Glad you're feeling better. Hey. Thank you, Mike. We also just met a few weeks ago. I guess we didn't have as much fun as you and Gabby, but <laughs> <laughs> we had met on the podcast, but we just met in person, right? Yeah, that was the first time in person you had done by the numbers, like just right before that. That's true. Um, happy to be here. I'm also allergic to numbers. I think that's a good way to put it. I've recently diagnosed myself with numbers only dyslexia. There's so a word for that, actually. Is there I, really? I don't I don't know it because I, I always forget it, but there is a word for it. Yeah, it's like a thing. Okay. I I think that I have it and I don't really know why I would diagnose myself at 30. I don't know if I can get like extra time on tests now, but uh let's let's do some numbers anyway. Happy to be here. Dyscalculia. There you go. Why would you make a dyslexic like the word for dyslexic, like why is that word so complicated? Well, if that seems so cool. the word. there's no numbers in the word, so but people could have not... both. There are they could yeah, have I'm both sure types. Do. Right. Well, okay. yeah, it's like the uh, the phobia. <laughs> the phobia for long words is like the longest word phobia. I feel like it's just like a joke. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a yeah. 26 letter word. It's really fun. Really funny. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, so yeah, great, uh, great to have you both on. And Amanda, you just had some SNL experience just recently um, with some people. So tell us about it real quick. I did. Uh, I saw uh, a show of this really awesome comic that I'm a big fan of. Her name is Mary Beth Barone. She has a new material night now on Mondays at Union Hall. And her it's a surprise lineup and her last comedian was Sarah Sherman, Sarah Squirm, I should say. Um, and I was sitting in the front and... I was kind of cold, so I had my arms crossed, and she told me to uncross my arms and unclench my butthole, and that was really <laughs> exciting for me. Did you? Uh, I did. I did both, but and then I like felt like my arms kept rising, but then I just like kind of like was like <laughs> holding them, like you know, co like cold sweating, trying to keep my arms down after that. And that's the second time I've been heckled by her. Not to brag. Um, and then last night I went to see Michael Che at the same. Union Hall in Park Slope, um, and I went upstairs to get a drink at some point. And this this club is a club. It's like the top floor is like a normal. Gabby and I have been up together a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like a J J really used cool. to have a yeah. running show there, and it's tiny. It's like a frat basement, serial killer frat basement, like maybe with like sixty seats. I, uh, again, maybe. numbers. Maybe <laughs> they're like foldable chairs, and it's it's like it's really small, the size of like a New York studio apartment. And it's just full yeah. of comics. Yeah. Um, uh, so I saw Michael Che and then I went upstairs and Punky Johnson was just playing bocce and I, I didn't say hi. I didn't I didn't want to. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm like, let let her play bocce, you know, on a Tuesday night. Let let the woman play bocce. So so that's what I did. But uh, <laughs> was really excited and really thinking about the episode. And they probably were not because they were probably looking forward to their break um, and probably, you know, taking some time not to think about the show. But super. Exciting. Yeah, we just had. A great three-show run, in my opinion. Uh, did Che mention Caitlin Clark? Anything like that about the episode and his and his set? 
I, he did not mention Caitlin Clark. It was a very P. Diddy heavy set. I, I, sure. <laughs> I won't say anything more, but that it was, he was like working out new material. Um, and actually, now that I think about it, he took, took our phones. So I probably shouldn't like divulge a lot of it, but uh, it was just like working out new stuff. That's like the fun thing about this specific comedy place is that it like it was like something I got the email for like that morning or the day before like sometimes like big comics will just drop in because they want to work out new material and not in front of more than you know 60 people in a frat basement uh, which is me <laughs> so there you go fair enough well looking forward to uh the next uh Netflix special that I guess is the most painful thing to watch on Netflix <laughs> <laughs> Uh, joke writer. So I can't wait to talk about this episode. Um, it was really fun to cover stat wise. So let's look at the screen time that we got. So yeah, I did allude to it that Gosling was just getting huge screen time, of course, in the cold open. So I, I put out there that the average host screen time is like 20 minutes, 20 and Gosling had that before update hit. So his he finished with 25 minutes, 56 seconds. So that is your third time host, Ryan Gosling, screen time over his eight appearances, followed by Chris Stapleton with a crazy stat number, just because I don't think I ever have ever seen someone just get 10 minutes exactly. So that's Chris Stapleton's time with two performances. And I thought great acting in that pre tape. Did you guys like the country pre tape? Yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah, I just never seen him act. I'd only know his personality outside of, you know, country music. So I thought he was excellent in that. Michael Che is the leading cast member of this episode. And it happens on occasion. Always hear about why does Joe get more time than Che? But this week, Che got more time than anyone. He had six minutes, 53 seconds, followed by Chloe Feynman. Got a lot of those responses on, on Twitter that she would be the leader. So she's number two behind Che. Um, she's 625. Michael Longfellow from zero to 552. So Longfellow status officially back. Keenan Thompson, 536. Heidi Gardner, who got a lot of buzz this week um, for a very awesome reason. So we'll talk about that. She had five minutes, 12 seconds. Moving down to Kate McKinnon, four minutes, 45 seconds. Shocking to see her back in that, at least for me. I didn't think that sketch would come back. Sarah Sherman, 418. Emily Blunt in the monologue, 4 minutes 4. Diz Mukes continuing his tear, 4 minutes 2 seconds. Ty with Colin Jost, 4 minutes 2 seconds. Bowen Yang, 4 minutes 1. Mikey Day, 348. Marcelo Hernandez is just showing up with the lunch pail and just putting in time every week. He had another great sketch that he led. So 3 minutes 31. Chloe Trost, 2 minutes 44 in the aforementioned country pre-tape. Thought she was awesome. Caitlin Clark, 2 minutes 21. Ego, 2 minutes 9. Morgan Stapleton, uh, guest on the tambourine in the OOs in the first performance, 2 minutes 6. Jadge, 1 minute 23. Low week for him. Molly, 29 seconds. Devin, 16 seconds. Punky, 15 seconds. Um, sure, she did great in bocce, though. And Steve Higgins, seven seconds so gabby who do you want to talk about from this episode i feel like we have to talk about shay for a bit like i mean i think it's you know largely because of that caitlin clark um savagery that happened but yeah i mean it's it's nice to see that he was able to get it you know thrown back in his face a little bit yeah and his uh he had two guests so he had longfellow and caitlin clark so a lot of the right. reason that joe gets more screen time is a lot of times the guests are on his side of the desk so we had uh two for two on Shay's side and uh yeah ha have you noticed that theme of his women's sports jokes this season or was i mean i don't think it's just this season i've definitely like these types of jokes are like michael Che's kind of mo a little bit <laughs> he likes a little bit of the edgier maybe the joke that gets the crowd just going ooh instead of just applauding <laughs> so i i definitely knew that this would i don't know like that when that compilation when they showed it i'm like yeah no this makes sense yeah they did cut the best joke because speaking from my point of view this is my first year following the wmba so they okay. did a joke earlier in the season when he mentioned the finals and he, he reported on the teams that were playing and they were just th the wrong teams 
and then call up the audience for not knowing that he was giving wrong information. <laughs> so that was like the the WNBA joke that was actually really good. They didn't include that one, but uh, it's his highest screen time of the year. He had over six minutes in the Adam Driver and Kate episodes, but this was his highest. So Amanda, who do you want to talk about from this list? Mm, I want to talk about Heidi, I think. I mean, I know we're going to talk about her break at some point, but that's just what's top of mind for me. Um, so that, that's what I'm going with. Yeah, so five minutes, 12 seconds. So this has been a little bit of a down run for Heidi stat-wise, but definitely not laugh-wise. Um, coming after the last run of three, Shane Gillis, seven minutes, 21. Sydney Sweeney, 11, 26. Josh Brolin, 7, 8. And then, yeah, with Rami, um, you know, she had her 500th appearance. So we talked about that a lot on the pod. A minute 48, Kristen Wiig, 252, and then basically doubled that almost in the Gosling episode with the 512. So what was your favorite Heidi moment of this of this episode other than the break? Did, any, anything that you liked from no, Heidi? I mean, the, the, that her, the Beavis and Butthead, that was like my one of my favorite moments of the season uh, immediately like instant classic to me. And I can't believe it because I don't usually like, like I, I wasn't obsessed with the Bart Simpson, Bart Sampson sketch. Uh, it's not like this is like typically what I go for, but that was like, I've watched it. Maybe I just feel like it's so long in my head because I've watched it no less than 10 times. Uh, <laughs> and, and not even a lot of it. I feel like it's been promoted to me on TikTok so many times, like just the break uh, and, and, and the, her break on like, Mikey and and Ryan continuing to break and I just yeah I just want to talk about it yeah well I mean let's just go right into it because anytime <laughs> SNL like penetrates the, the bubble to the outside world in a big way um you know whether it's SZA song or you know anything controversial for good or bad reasons and this was probably the most fun reason just because I think it couldn't have happened to a better cast member Heidi just known for being so pitch perfect in her character work and when she's called upon to just be a straight role like she was in that sketch and it happening so organically i was you know doing the stat i'm about to show on the screen and i was just even like beaming smiling watching her break because when you see someone that's trying so hard and they can't help it that's when it comes across so do you guys ever have problems with breaking too much or is is there a level because we're about to look at some ryan gosling break stats so Gabby, what's your opinion overall on breaking on SNL? Yeah, so I I feel like this whole episode brought that concept to me and like the made me think a little bit more about like when is breaking like okay with the viewer? You know, when are they kind of along for the ride? And I think what the conclusion that I've come to is that breaking is like okay and enjoyable when you like the person who's breaking and like it because it's more endearing to you that way like if someone's breaking and you don't really care for them it's just kind of like okay come on let's like get it together but if it's someone that you like like seeing it's like a i don't know like a happy like event um that being said i the first time that i watched the episode through i did think that ryan's breaking was like a bit much um and that it kind of because i think he broke in every single sketch um, and I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, like I don't think the only place where he didn't break was well, I don't think he broke in the monologue and obviously the um, papyrus too that wasn't even in the episode technically. Um, and that was a pre tape. So I, I think that like, I don't know, it, it was a bit much. But there were times like in the Beavis and Butthead, I think that it really did help and just made the whole thing goofier, and just sillier overall. Yeah, I think that's the theme, though, is when I when I watch, I'm rooting for the cast members not to break because they're doing something that's so difficult that we can't comprehend that they're up there and there's an audience full of people like sometimes nervously laughing. And then when you see someone else break, it's like seeing someone else cry or someone else throw <laughs> up. You're like, I want to do it, too. So when Ryan Gosling breaking so much and he's having such a fun time and yeah. I don't blame them. But in that situation, I, especially with the dramatic irony of everyone seeing Mikey 
in the butthead prosthetics <laughs> and Heidi not having that ability. So when she had to turn around, that's you know when hell broke loose. But let's get some guesses from you guys. Amanda, I did the stat of all Ryan Gosling's live screen time. Um, so not including the pre-tapes. And then I eliminated when he was just being himself more or less. So I didn't do the monologue or the musical performance introduction. So what percentage of his screen time this week do you think was breaking? Just give me a percent. Okay. If I'm wrong, it's because I have a disability. Uh, so <laughs> you, can't, <laughs> you can't say shit about it. Uh, I'm going to say 30%. Gabby, what about you? I was going to say 40%. I don't have a disability, but <laughs> I am a lawyer like Amanda. So we are very numbers averse. <laughs> so Gabby, 40%. Amanda, what did you say again? I said 30, but now I want to say 35. Say 39. <laughs> I could just 39. I could just say 40. I mean 30. What? So the answer is going to be 15.4%. And okay. so what we have here is his screen time in the live segments, which was Close Encounter, Cold Open. Again, skip the monologue where he was, you know, being himself. Of course, he's playing a character as himself. But I did measure that. There was like a little breaking. And uh, for me, defining breaking was when it's an involuntary laugh or smile or flub due to, you know, the situation. So it's a stat that I probably will never do again, but if there's a <laughs> high break host ratio, at least I'll have a baseline to compare it to Gosling. So that's, yeah, cold and, and uh, sorry, close encounter, cold open, the engagement, the can't tonight sketch with Keenan and Marcelo, Beavis and Butthead, of course, doctor sketch with Bowen, and then the Aaron Brockovich 10 to 1 with Chloe. So in the close encounter, cold open, Ryan Gosling spent 30%. Of the sketch breaking a minute 14 out of his four minutes seven. Um, the engagement sketch I thought was probably his best acting performance. He had to do a lot of whispering and you know, I working with his mukes and having him just look at you and you're in that character. So, credit to Ryan for not breaking more. So, 19 seconds out of his four minutes 38 of uh screen time, which is about seven percent to break percentage. The Can't Tonight sketch, 15 seconds out of three and a half minutes. That's 7%. The Beavis and Butthead, I'm sure you could guess, was the highest break rate because he had less screen time. And a lot of it was either being very earnest and being like, oh, me? I'm just, you know, oh, sorry. <laughs> but then we was with Mikey. They were breaking a lot. So that's 37 seconds out of about two minutes for a 31% break rate. 11 seconds out of 229 in the Doctor sketch. I felt like his character was already kind of really weird and giggly and it wasn't him breaking uh, by accident. It was part of it. So low break rate there. And then 17 seconds out of about two minutes in the Aaron Brockovich um, sketch at the end, which is 14%. So we had some high guesses from the panel here. But yeah. would, if I told you <laughs> without, you know, just completely out of nowhere that someone was breaking on SNL for 15%, would you be like they must have not have been a good host then or what's your opinion amanda i wasn't really expecting ryan gosling to break less i feel like you're being generous and if anything like i feel like maybe i'm surprised at how low the doctor sketch yeah. percentage is and i feel like maybe you were just being generous with him that his character was like supposed to be that giggly and I, and I do think there is was a fine line in that sketch between breaking and like whatever playing to the that personality that was supposed to be. And also half of his face was covered. So I feel like he was like kind of able to smile without you seeing uh, for, for parts of it. And also I think his hair was why he was breaking to, uh, you know, in a lot of it. But I, I wouldn't want a 15 percent break rate. Also, by the way, this is unbelievable that you did this. Like, I feel yeah. like this is really crazy statistics and not just because we're number numerically challenged. And, <laughs> yeah, and that's a good term for it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is really amazing. So, um, oh, thanks, Amanda. Yeah, hats this off. is definitely, yeah, thank you, Gabby. This is a <laughs> unique one because I mean, it, it was mostly objective, but there was times where I was like rewinding and saying like, oh, he couldn't, you know, not smile there. So that's like a second of breaking, let alone like full on laughter 
or having to look away from the camera or hide his face. So there were times where it, it almost made me uncomfortable because I'm just studying his body language and you realize <laughs> things that you'd never look for in a sketch because you're following the plot and getting the jokes. So you don't look at the nervous like ticks that people have. Um, so so li little tough stat to do. But like I said, we can if it happens in the future or maybe when Gosling comes back for the fourth, because I know he will um, compare it and maybe you'll have to go look at the break rate of the previous two. So. Do you want to take a guess at how much time Heidi spent breaking in the Beavis and Butthead pre uh, not pre tape sketch? Like percentage wise or just time? Um, how long was the sketch? The sketch was one second. Um, no, that's not how long it was. That's how long I need to look it up. Or how long? What was her like screen time in the sketch? I guess if that's what we're going off, off of. Okay, so it was Heidi had three minutes and twenty seven seconds of screen time. Okay. In a five minute fifty nine second sketch, it was a long sketch. It was. I think because of yeah, the breaking. <laughs> yeah. <I think> so. <laughs> yeah, it kind of stretched it out a bit. Yeah. Um, what was her time again? It was three twenty seven. 327. Okay. I'm going to guess that she spent like 50 seconds breaking. I, I don't know. Maybe it's another crazy overestimate, but. Amanda, you have a guess? I'm 40 seconds. <laughs> 49. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a minute 10, which is, I, I was surprised oh. at how high that was. So I'm sure that uh, eclipses Heidi's career break screen time. Yeah, yeah. I, I was pretty rattled by it, right? I think I saw her speak about how she got anxious when she walked when she walked back to her uh, dressing room, and everyone was like telling her that she did a good job, and she's like, "Did I?" <laughs> but um, oh wow, yeah. But it Dude, was great. It I loved it. <laughs> It is fun too when the audience, when it, it once it goes on just enough that the audience has like an ovation for the break because they're, mm. you know, they're normally giving them some grace to keep going. And then once it goes far enough, people get excited that they're almost witnessing <laughs> something so real that they're happy to be a part of it. So, I, I just for me, I'm such a huge Heidi fan. And to see that, I thought was just like actually a great moment for her career. And it didn't really show weakness as much as it showed like humanity not to get too deep about it but. yeah, yeah. They're real I, feel people. Like, <laughs> I feel like i feel like i feel like people who are not super fans like us on social media who are sharing that clip i feel like the need to be like no you don't understand like this doesn't happen like this is not this the reason that it's so crazy is because they, she just like got got like that and she couldn't recover like that it reminds me of um you know the sketch where like 80s uh, like uh, someone on the crew comes in like prematurely when 80s like and it's like when she's like at the at the news desk uh yes. yeah I think it's like yes. Woody Harrelson right I love uh, that so much <laughs> I just like couldn't recover like it was just like, it was just gone and like that's just like so funny do we know um I don't know if, if John talked about this on Monday if did were they not dressed up during dress like was that the first time well, I know on the round table, John was uh, one of my favorite round tables of all time. I think it had um, Gary Kroger, you know, SNL alum, and he was giving his insight that in times like that, they'll maybe, you know, they have the same premise, of course, the same blocking, but they'll just kind of ramp up the, um, the prosthetics or the makeup or the costume. So I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case, because if that was your first time seeing Mikey Day look yeah. like that then, you know, God help you if you can hold it together. So props to Keenan and Longfellow, you know, on the other <laughs> end for, for doing that and the the extras. Yeah. yeah. I, I was also thinking that even if they were dressed like this in dress, she was not facing them the whole time. So like you can, you could have seen it like all day, like they could have been in front of her all day. And suddenly she still has to turn around. Like, I don't think anything can prepare you for the jarring. Like, oh my goodness, that's that's what your face looks like right now. So Yeah. And how did they do that? <laughs> Does how did they how did they get Mikey's lips to like stay to up like, like that? that? I, I mean, do I think not it's understand. the prosthetics, no? I don't think his mouth is actually like just taped up. The oh, whole it's like time. one of those like 
those dentist things maybe like like how sarah sarah has one of those dentist. yeah like sarah and the roller coaster michael b jordan um, yeah. sketch but i mean i feel like it was his real mouth they didn't put something over it they just had to really like glue okay. it up there or something i tried on, a little bit yeah, I was trying to see if you, I could like pull my lips up. Like that. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't. Just like I don't staring think in the mirror, trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "What muscle is this?" Yeah. But unbelievable all around. It's the anyway. butt head muscle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just here to learn about AI. So. Yeah. <laughs> I learned so, so much. <laughs> so, 15.4 percent of Ryan Gosling's time live was spent breaking, but I don't know if. Uh, first time host could ever get away with that. We look back at his first time, of course, he did break, but maybe it's just he's so likable and he's having so much fun, loves the show. So maybe if you had a bad attitude and really didn't appreciate being on that stage in this amazing show and didn't really get it, it would think people would think you're just like goofing off and not taking it mm -hmm. seriously. But in this case, it just kind of an anomaly of how much people embrace the break. Um, so I don't know if that would, you know, we would see that with somebody else, but anyway, let's talk about recurring characters. I think we've talked about that too much. It's a theme on this podcast that in the modern SNL era, there's not a lot of them, but because, you know, and, we, and there was actually a great discussion on the round table as well. So check that out if you haven't about how SNL is digested differently. And back in the day, if you didn't catch SNL live, you would never see it again. So these characters would come back more regularly. So I wanted to look at how much recurring characters and impressions we have seen this year and who's really benefiting from the most. So shout out to EGOD, my man Eric, for compiling these stats right here. There's a lot of stuff on the screen, but the important column to look at is the screen time percentage in all recurring so we looked at recurring characters recurring impressions and then the rest of their screen time not doing those things so i'm sure you could guess who number one is it's james austin johnson who spends a lot of his time in the trump prosthetic so 38.2 percent of his screen time this season has been doing recurring characters or impressions that's eight impressions and four characters um the people who have none Trost, Dismukes, Jost, and Shay. So they're at the bottom. But I'll go down the list a little bit, and then I want you to think about a recurring character or impression that you'd want to see again this season. Um, Devin Walker's number two. He's had seven recurring impressions, a lot of those, you know, uh, sports figures, and, of course, Tim Scott, the South Carolina senator. So 29.4% of Devin's screen time has been in a recurring capacity. Mikey Day, 25.1%. Keenan, 23.4%. Bowen, 19.2%. And Heidi, 14.1%. So that's anytime they've reprised a character or impression, that would be that screen time. So Gabby, what about you? What's a character or impression of this modern cast that you really like from this season or past that you'd want to see again? I kind of really like uh, Dr. Please. Um, I don't know. There's something, the creepiness. I, I just love the way that, that Bowen like plays the character. And I don't know if I'm in the minority there <laughs> because um, watching uh, the sketch this episode, um, he, I forget what he says, but it's like early on in the sketch where he just kind of like backs away um, I think maybe the grieving family asks him to leave. And I thought that it was the most hilarious thing. I don't think the audience like agreed with me because they were kind of quiet or the laughter wasn't as loud as they would have expected. So I like that kind of, I don't know, weird, creepy, funny thing. Um, and just while we're on the topic of recurring characters, um, the uh, Lisa from Temecula. Okay. I thought it was hilarious the first time. I thought it was pretty funny the second time. And then the third time around, um, I was just, I just wasn't sure exactly how they were going to do it because I feel like the joke was kind of played out a bit, but I still had a great time. I thought it was a, I thought it was still a pretty solid sketch. And so I, I don't think we necessarily need to see it again, but I am curious to see how they kind of like play with it in the future. Well, I'm so glad you brought up those two examples. Um, one, while we're talking about Lisa, 
late night after party, John and I were talking to Alex English for like 20, oh, 25 cool. minutes. And like we're fully encouraging him to bring back Lisa. <laughs> so if, if they do and you don't like it, you can be mad at us. Okay. But we're just saying that uh, get Lisa somewhere else maybe because yeah. I love Ego's character and the costume and just like the energy that she brings. But maybe yeah. the dinner table is played out. I mean, I liked it all three times, to be honest. But maybe mm -hmm. I, I said like, Let's put Lisa in the grocery store. Her just commentary, anything I would Let's enjoy. Let's put her back in Temecula. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see her. Let's see Lisa's family <laughs> all gather together and cause the largest earthquake ever known on Earth. <laughs> yeah, the, the Temecula um, family reunion. That should yeah, maybe that could be the finale. So, so if we get it, Mr. one or English, two more times. If you're listening. <laughs> Yeah, we, we love LFT, so I'll, I'll take her back anytime. So maybe <laughs> next season we'll get another one. And then, yeah, Dr. Please. So if, if you didn't catch, you know, uh, really fully get what was going on, it was the character from the back of the plane and the Nate Bargatze, um, like who has the most important job, talking about teachers and lawyers and doctors. And so does anyone a doctor? And Bowen is in the, the last row of the plane wearing the identical costume with the wig. <laughs> And he stands up and the same creepy mannerisms. Amanda, did you not get that that was a recurring character? I did. Well, I didn't at the time. And then I think I heard it on the Hot Take show. But it also reminded me of the – it was a character that Bowen played for the Quint of Brunson episode where they're like pretending not to know each other or something. And then his hair keeps yeah. being in different it, lengths. I thought that was what it was like. Oh, the midwife by. sketch. Yes. Yeah, I know yes. what you're talking about. Yeah, Clearly they were doing like time jumps. Yeah. yeah, like that's like, I feel like this is like a little bit Bowen's vibe. Like this is like kind of his like go-to kind of like creepy, weird, but like deadpan. Like, you know, just like leaning into just like saying like cookie crumbles with like a completely straight face. But And like, like I feel like Bowen does well in a long wig. Like that's like. That's his MO. Like he's good in that. So like I almost <laughs> felt like, oh, this feels familiar, but I don't I definitely didn't put two and two together from that uh the airplane sketch. Um yeah, I was full on Leo DiCaprio meme pointing at the screen, being like, <laughs> How is that character back? And I just can't think of the <laughs> example in history of seemingly a throwaway character. I, um when <laughs> only thing I could think of was the name change sketch. In the 46 premiere, Chris Rock, when they had, you know, the uh, the COVID, like, uh, contact tracing, and Ego Wodum's name was Edith Puthy. <laughs> that was her, her name she was sure. going to change. And then they brought that character back in the uh, Boomers Got the Vax with Maya Rudolph. Yeah. And so yeah. that's like the only example, but, <laughs> like, that one at least had some through line, I guess. I mean, all of a sudden she's rapping in a pre-tape, like, I would never have guessed that, but this one seemingly almost like Bowen had a sketch for that character that didn't get made or something and then wanted to throw him in when they mentioned doctors. So I, I mean, I, I doubt that that's what happened, but kind of like thinking of how the situation could occur of <laughs> a character that was literally like a throwaway and almost, I remember watching that sketch with Bargazzi and like wanting more from that character. So it's, I'm amazed that we got it. Um, but Amanda, yeah, what about you? Is there a recurring impression or character? That... I'm not going to lie. I'm having trouble thinking of one. And Gabby took. Oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I, it's allergy season. Uh, uh, Lisa from Temecula is obviously the standout one that they've tried, you know, in, in recent years. And uh, I think about um, the trend forecasters a lot like that was one that i really liked and if 80 ever comes back that's what i would like to see but i can can you give to what what comes to mind like what are some from this season that i can I look at a master from? list uh that's you know definitely another great wig moment in bowen history <laughs> um the trend that's forecasters true. yeah um but yeah i'll just also read you know people who aren't watching with us the like the totals so recurring characters um, James Austin Johnson, four, Keenan, four, Bowen, four, including Dr. Please and Garrett from Hinge. Uh, the, uh, the, also Heidi with three, Mikey with two, Ego with two, one being Lisa, Marcelo and Punky with one apiece. 
And then recurring impressions, of course, James Austin Johnson leading that as well with eight, Devin Walker seven, Mikey six, Keenan six, Bowen four, Heidi three, Ego two, Longfellow two, uh, Marcelo one, Chloe three, and then Molly and Sarah with one each. So that's the recurring impression total and the recurring character total. So yeah, I mean, other recurring ones i mean of course we have punky in the same sketch as the cousin of lisa from temecula so it's even the small ones they, they count so let's just move on to a kind of general talk about is it a benefit what, what what's the what does it mean to have recurring characters or something because i'll give my take first of it usually means that it was successful the first time so it's definitely a benefit but is is there room in this era for this? Gabby, Like, what is your overall take on the recurring nature here? I feel like recurring characters can be good for getting um, non-avid SNL viewers interested. I think it's like an easy kind of pop culture reference to make. So it's really good for like SNL as a whole to have these kinds of things circulating. Um, I think though there is like just, you know, speaking larger like conceptually kind of a risk of uh the cast members kind of getting typecast into certain things um you know like in role in roles outside of snl but i do like i do like recurring characters i think that they are like an important thing to have but i don't think that it's always necessary like just looking at the stats here um it looks like most or at least a good chunk of the cast members don't really have any recurring characters or impressions, but I think that they're still very strong performers and they're still very memorable. So I don't think it's necessarily needed. Um, I'm sure there's also stuff to say about like how uh, recurring characters are kind of viewed today versus maybe in the early 2000s, 90s and earlier. Like I think that like we can all call like to our minds certain characters from the years past but they're like I said, I, I don't think that it's necessarily like needed. Yeah, I mean, all, all great points, especially the first one that you made. Um, but it's, I would say, it's also favors the cast members with, with longevity because they can they have a bigger yeah. arsenal to pull from. Where someone Definitely. like Keenan, like we had him play OJ at Update this week, that was cut. So he played Charles Barkley last week. Just Keenan has a huge roster to draw from <laughs> with his characters and of course if you look like someone famous that you can play who's relevant to the news a lot then of course you're going to play them a lot so yeah. especially politically like we saw with devin walker as tim scott or of course the trump impression so someone on this list who does not have longevity of course who has zero recurring characters and zero recurring impressions yet because she's only been on the cast for 17 episodes is someone I want to talk about next who at the beginning of the season, you know, we didn't really know what we we're going to get from her. So we couldn't really judge the comedy or our opinions yet, but now we have a good sample size. So it's 17 episodes of Chloe Trost. So I've just become a huge Trost fan. I, I told her that the uh, little orphan Cassidy sketch with the moon was top three of the season. And I think that this, Get That Boy Back pre-tape is now probably in my top 10. So we know Chloe from her singing, and I put a list of all her appearances. So that's 40 appearances so far for a total of 40 minutes and 37 seconds. So while I read the other stats comparing it to rookies, Gabby, Amanda, if you can read all these and uh, maybe highlight some of Trost's uh, rookie season appearances. But I wanted to look at how our other cast members looked like when they were 17 episodes in and what their stats were. So I ranked them by the power ranking to get the full picture, but I also put appearances, screen time, and what episode they peaked stat-wise in their rookie year. So I'll read them in order. James Austin Johnson had the best rookie year of anyone on here. Um, he had 42 appearances. He peaked in his very first episode the Owen Wilson episode opening as Biden um, being in a bunch of sketches in his first night as an SNL cast member. Marcelo Hernandez had the second best rookie season. 
um, 50 minutes, 30 seconds of screen time. Oh, by the way, JJ, over an hour of screen time in his first 17 episodes, which is crazy. But yeah, Marcelo Sneaky had like a really good rookie campaign. So again, these are only through the first 17 to keep him on par with where Trost is right now. Uh, Marcelo peaked in the Ortega episode. So he had the Waffle House sketch that was really popular in that one as well, followed by Michael Longfellow. So we've talked about him so much this year because he's been so down compared to his rookie year, but he had a great rookie year. 49 appearances, peaked in the Molly Shannon episode, which was his 17th. Devin Walker next. Um, he was 40 minutes screen time and 49 appearances, tied with Longfellow. Then, then Bo and Yang. So back in season 45, his 17th episode was an at-home episode. Then uh, Molly. So Molly beat um, a lot of people. So I'd like to see more of them before the season wraps up. But Molly, they were in 31 sketches and 41 minutes of screen time. Then Chloe Feynman, rookie uh, classmate of Bowen's, 43 appearances. Not a lot of screen time, no, only 31 minutes. Then Chloe Trost, right in the middle. So again, they're ranked by their power ranking, their average of the whole season, at least through 17. And Chloe Trost is at a 34.4. The average before her, 34.1. So Chloe Trost having a very right down the middle, solid rookie year. Amanda, where uh, what sketch of Chloe's do you want to talk about real quick? Well, I also I'm, my, what jumps out to me is that Chloe is the first rookie cast member in a while to be in a class of her own huh like, yeah it's been years I, I i do you anyone know off the top of their head like it, it, i want to say it, casey will when okay so a while uh yeah like 15 years <laughs> yeah so <laughs> chloe i i i know that the you know the sophomore class and the rookie class kind of go hand in hand and that they're all featured players and you're in a sense, competing uh, with with all the the featured players for screen time, but I, I mean, any I really really liked the pre tape this week, and I think that was my favorite um, Chloe Tro sketch. I liked the um, bumper cars sketch last weekend. Like I really liked the the Chloe Trost reveal in that sketch, so <laughs> that was really fun to me. I am just I think that Chloe has a really cool presence um and i like seeing her on the screen like i feel like i find her interesting to watch and a little bit different and now that i'm thinking about it is she she's not like a pure stand-up i guess the, the way some of her like, i feel like she does like sketch I, stuff on social media right what what i think she has a show coming up at union hall i bought tickets well, Bell House. So, oh Bell House, <laughs> yes Bell yeah. House. so i'll see i'll report back <laughs> Like she gives me more variety vibes, you know, like she's, I feel like she's kind of kooky in a good way. And I feel like I, I maybe like in a little bit of a Sarah Sherman way, like in terms of the standups, like that she's just interesting to watch. I'm looking now. I liked Fully Naked in New York. I mean, that, that obviously wasn't, I just like Chloe singing. Um, Make Your Own Kind of Music was really good. Yeah, that's her longest appearance of the season, five minutes, eight seconds. So she was playing Mama Cass, and I thought that was the best sketch of the Emma Stone episode. So that was really, uh, and statistically, that's her breakout episode. So Chloe Trost, again, that's that was the sixth episode of her rookie season. So she could still break that the next three shows, but has just been, yeah, super solid. The other longest appearances was that Little Orphan Cassidy sketch I mentioned that was almost five minutes. And yeah, just a lot of like solid supporting roles that you want from a featured player, but also can really stand out. So of course the singing does that, but yeah, kind of just like a theater kid, but in a good way and kind of just yeah. do it all. Yeah. She gives me like edgier Cecily Strong vibes. Like that's, that's my prediction for Great her. Great take. Thank you. It was, it was a risk. <laughs> I appreciate yeah, like it. Not, not, as, not as safe. Yeah. Not to say Cecily isn't edgy, but you know. No, I, I get it, yeah. And then uh, a minute 40 in the HR meeting sketch with Shane Gillis. Of course, a lot of people on stage for that one. And then, yeah, Get That Boy Back was a minute 41 this week. Cinema Classics, that was in the Kate episode when she was Judy Garland. So that's 2.15 for screen time there. And, uh, yeah, Gabby, what have you seen from Chloe Tross? Are you a fan? 
Yeah, I feel like I'm slowly becoming, well, not maybe rapidly becoming a Chloe Trost stan. I don't know. There's just something about her that I find um, hilarious and like endearing. I love Make Your Own kind of music. I thought that that was phenomenal. And I just, like everyone else, just wanted to see more of her singing. And I'm glad that we got that this episode and we got her doing it in a very like comical way. And so I like, um, the pre-tape from this episode and make your own kind of music are definitely my faves of her. And I'm very excited to see what else you get to see. <laughs> and the singing is talked about a lot and it should be. Um, it's not something that's at all new on SNL. There's been great singers before, but I mean, I feel like she has to be the best and also can sing and impression sing, which is not easy yeah. to do either. So, you know, we saw Melissa was uh, definitely a better impressionist than singer, but and I thought Melissa was a good singer, but kind of would sound similar where Chloe Trost in that, first of all, pitch perfect Mama Cass impression yeah. and then had to sing as Mama Cass in weird ways that Emma Stone's crazy character would set up and in different tempos and different keys of the same song. So it was not an easy sketch musically for her. And, I, you know, you couldn't tell by watching it because it was so smooth. Um, so I'll look at the bottom here because there are some people at the bottom that didn't come back for a second season, but also people that were at the bottom who are still in the cast who are now like thriving. So look at the bottom, say six. So after Trost was Ego. Um, so Ego had only 30 minutes of screen time in her first year. It was a stacked cast, but appeared a lot 43 times. So that's on the higher end there and peaked in her 12th episode, which was hosted by Halsey. And then following Ego is Sarah Sherman, who now is like you would never think didn't have a great rookie year stat wise, but was near the bottom. And then there's Mukes, who really was a slow burn and now, as I think, is like winning everyone's hearts. Then, of course, the bottom three, Lauren Holt, 23.2 average power ranking, very low, um, 30 appearances, 23 minutes of screen time. Punky Johnson, only 21 minutes and 26 appearances didn't peak till the very end in the 20th episode of her rookie year. And then, of course, Aristotle, who had 13 minutes, 21 seconds of screen time, um, peaked in the Jonathan Majors episode where he was the Laughintosh 3000 at update. So you see people like Sarah, Andrew, and Punky, who we all know and love now and are doing so much better. So, Amanda, do you think that some people aren't cut out for SNL or if you leave them there long enough, they'll show that they were meant to be there in the first place. Any opinions on those one season wonders? I'll have the Luke Null stats and the Heidi and Chris Red stats soon enough. But until then, what do you think about those one season wonders? Uh, I, I think that they were not. I think that to be a successful rookie, you have to do one of two things. You have to stand out and do something stand out and, you know, show that you can kind of be an island or you need to start kind of, planting those roots to be like a real utility player, a real anchor, which I assume that Dismukes did. I think that Ego probably did like maybe, you know, they weren't having like Sarah Sherman yelling at Colin Jost viral moments in their rookie season, but they were really showing their chops and they could anchor a sketch and that they could be, you know, they're like could be molded into SNL legends, even if they weren't, you know, standing out at the update desk their first year. I, I think that the one season wonders, probably didn't either um for for whatever reason i mean i think that with aristotle it's hard his numbers are so low it's hard i, I think that we liked a lot of the sketch uh, the few sketches that he was in i think that they were all you know none of them were clunkers that like we, we were he was endearing in some of his sketches um but for whatever reason they just that was it so it would be hard for him to have left an impression in any capacity so yeah, just breakthrough. So I feel like with Chloe Trost, she broke through with that Chalamet sketch or even a small breakthrough. Like I remember Punky Johnson rookie year, you know, we're barely seeing her. It was the COVID season. The cast was bigger than ever, 21 people. And then we saw just enough from Punky in the stroll into the polls that I was right away like, okay, I like Punky Johnson. Like, you know, before you kind of can't tell because you don't see them a lot. So you don't know if they're great or they're not so great. And then you see one moment like that. And with Sarah Sherman, it was that like um, at home poop testing <laughs> kit that they had the 10 to one her and his mukes with Owen Wilson. 
And so we got something from Sarah, but didn't really know her style too much unless you were familiar with her before the show. Um, and then next thing you know, she's in like a couple pre-tapes that really showed that off. So Gabby, is what's the right time to peak in your rookie year? Because as I mentioned, I do have their statistical peak on this chart. Is it better to peak at the beginning or at the end or in the middle? Because again, I'm sure all these people, no matter what, will peak, you know, more in the future. But yeah. in your rookie year, like what's the ideal time? This sounds like a secret math question. Yeah, no, I know. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the episodes. I, I don't know. I don't want to, you know, give the lawyer answer, but I feel like it depends. <laughs> It depends. Well, um, the peak has to be a real peak. Like, yeah. if, if your peak is high, then I think it doesn't matter so much where we're in the show. True, but it is. If your peak is low, it's it's just yeah. I think probably a peak. Yeah, I think that's a better like assessment of it. Like, it it doesn't have to do with just you know just one really good episode or one really good sketch. It really just has to kind of average out a bit. <laughs> to be memorable and show that you're a good fit for the cast. And I feel like looking at your numbers, you would think that it'd be not good to peak early because that looks like you're maybe not coming back. But I feel like as a risk averse person, I'd want to peak earlier because then it's like, I'd feel like, okay, like I, you know, I had had like an amazing night. Like I don't have to stress about like, you know, okay, there's only six episodes left. Like, how am I going to get this, this character on uh, update? How am I going to get this sketch on? But the numbers w would say otherwise. So the average time that a rookie peaks on SNL is about episode 12. So if it averaged all the, the peaks, that's what we got. So average power ranking was 34.1. Like I said, Chloe Trost is literally right there. Um, average appearances through 17 episodes of a rookie year, 37.9. Average screen time, 35 minutes. So that's you know, where you want to be, you don't want to be below the average, of course. And if you're like James Austin Johnson or Marcelo, then, you know, you, you kind of already have signed your year two deal. If you have that kind of stats, at least in my opinion. And one more thing we should talk about is just like the circumstances. So of course, stats don't lie. They're completely objective, but at the same time, as I mentioned with like the COVID year election year with, Jim Carrey, Biden, long ass cold opens, and it were maybe it's cameo heavy in other ways, harder to break through. So at least for Chloe Trost, I think she has what it takes, and there's more of a runway. And my final thought is, wow, the rookies last year all did really well. So that's most impressive because you see, you know, Ego Wodum, Sarah Sherman, Dismukes, people like that. That their stats were not great rookie season and i can't wait to go back and get more of those rookie year stats but for four rookies coming last year that they all did really well so i hope they're all back in 50. so we are gonna wrap up by looking at this season of snl not the previous seasons and look at season 49 power rankings so far so 17 episodes as mentioned huge chart all these episodes and let's look at the results so this is taking into consideration screen time, appearances, saying live from New York, those recurring characters we talked about. And Heidi Gardner, still queen of the cast with a 90 average. So even with a little slump-ish stat-wise in this last run, still at the top at a 90. But Mikey Day right behind 88.8. Bowen Yang, 88.3. Little drop to Colin Jost, Keenan, and Ego in the 70s. James Austin Johnson, a 72. Then another drop. We have Chloe Feynman in eighth place. She had a great episode. You know, highest screen time outside Che with Gosling. She's at a 65.3. There's Mukes and Sarah still like neck and neck. 62.6 and 61.6. Marcelo and Che in the high 50s. And then at the bottom of the cast, we have Devin at 42. Longfellow, who had his second best episode of the year. His best was the Emma Stone episode. Second best was Gosling. 36.1, Punky 34.9, Chloe Tros 34.1, and Molly Carney 24.4. Gabby, first time I'm by the numbers. You look at the craziest chart of all. 
I yes. need your take on the rankings of this cast. Um, my take is the colors are pretty. Thank um, you very much. <laughs> and it looks like a weather map, but for SNL, it's fun. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that, I mean, I my attention is immediately drawn after Heidi, obviously, to Molly. And I wish that we could see more of them. <laughs> uh, if not this season, hopefully. If not before the end of the season, hopefully by by next. Um, I think that uh, it's that they're pretty promising, and that um, I don't know. Even <laughs> I, I just keep thinking about the Doctor Please sketch and how they accidentally like put rammed a wheelchair into Bowen's like the back of his knee. <laughs> And I thought that was great. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of promise there. So I want to see more of that. And of course, I can see Chloe there, um, not too well immediately um, above. Still want to see more of her. And I'm actually kind of surprised to see Marcelo um, rank at eleven. I feel like that's kind of low, just if I were to think about you know like who's on SNL right now. And I feel like he's really broken out just um, and gained a falling, a, a significant falling outside of just SNL. So I, that's kind of surprising to me to see that he's he's in the lower half of this. Yeah, competitive cast. My take on Marcelo, who's right above average. I think I've been saying this, I think, since the first SNL by the numbers ever, way back in 2020, like what to explain the stat that no one's ever heard of which was like what averages and so above or below to kind of see in hindsight, was it a good episode for them or not? And it's like a 58. So I think I'm going to call it the Che line because Michael okay. Che's career average is a 58.0. Um, so, and you know, he's a, a weekend update anchor. So if you can score higher than update anchor, that means pretty good. And mathematically that's above average. So Marcelo, I feel like his sketches, he's going to have, like he's getting a lot of lead sketches, but he's not being used utility much elsewhere. So his screen time is kind of staying at the three to five minute mark, which is definitely good, but is not anywhere close to like a Mikey or a Heidi or a Keenan who you can like punch into any sketch to make it better. Maybe Marcelo has like the Kristen Wig um, retirement party toast where he gets, you know, five seconds in there. But right. I, Marcelo is like occupying a really strong lane by having his own brand and getting his own sketches out there. So that's my take on that. But as far as uh, Molly, two things. One, they had a decent run between Driver and Dakota Johnson. So they had a 48, 42, 42, 54. Other than that, pretty not so great stat season for Molly. So I've said it a million times on this pod, but they really broke out with the um, end of the year update piece last year. So I'm hoping yeah. maybe history repeats itself for Molly. And I wanted to ask you guys, did you hear the, the beep beep that was said a couple times in this episode, Amanda? Yeah, it was in the Aaron Brockovich sketch, right? Keenan says it. Keenan said beep beep, but Molly also said beep beep in the moment Gabby mentioned oh. bringing out Mikey <laughs> in, the, in the wheelchair. Like, <laughs> beep, beep, like grandpa's here and there's mikey in the wheelchair i feel like we're crazy uh, we're, we're starting yes. to feel like taylor swift fans where we're like yeah. hanging on to everything <laughs> we're like they did this on i mean and i'm sure the beep beep they did um this is a bad example i'm just teasing but it's like we're like oh wow that's brilliant it's a through line the theme of season 49 <laughs> is beep beep there's all these easter eggs when in reality maybe maybe not but but i like it I think it has to be intentional to happen twice. That's just my opinion. <laughs> and yeah, we're gonna we, start I mean, watching who, the sorry, we're gonna start watching the episodes in reverse, seeing looking for secret messages. <laughs> yeah, but who who but us? I mean, we're we're the yeah. fan community that would appreciate something like that. So you know, where Taylor Swift might have just all these intentional things, why can't SNL have some things for the fans? I, I mean, we got I Tiny agree. Horse too, we got Papyrus too online do you have any thoughts yeah. on that how it was not in the episode but they teased it during it amanda i mean that's brilliant that's the kind of stuff that they should be doing i feel like that they don't harness the power of social media and that they don't really self-promote 
enough at all. It's like kind of in line with them starting to do like the behind the episode. Uh, I, I have deleted Instagram, but I get them on TikTok where they, you know, have the cast members talk about. Um, I just saw the Bowen one, right? That was the most recent mm-hmm. one. Bowen talking about the, the Sydney Sweeney, the straight Bowen, Bowen straight. Was that the name of the sketch? The yeah. Yep. Okay. Beautiful. Um, they should be doing that stuff. I, I, part of me is like, it should be canon. It should be on the show. It was so good. But if, if they direct you to it and we get it online, then I don't, I don't necessarily want to have lost any of the live sketches for the pre date. So I, I sometimes I'm like, can they just go a little longer? Like if they have like a banger like that, just like six more minutes. I don't know how network television works. It should be, it shouldn't be that hard. That's all I have to say. Well, as one of you <laughs> astutely put earlier that the breaking could have factored, but also in what world does SNL have time for a six minute, 42 second pre-tape. Yeah. pre-tape. Was that how long it was? It was, yeah, it it was, was like a movie. <laughs> okay, well it flew Short by because it was masterful. Yeah, so. I thought. It, I mean, it, the resources that went into it, you know, we got some leaked images online of like Ryan on the streets of New York filming that and the hype for Papyrus before was huge. So then going into the episode was huge. But I, was there a plan? Like, I, I really want to talk to someone involved with the Paul Rudd COVID episode because the an evening with Pete, that kind of like raging bull, it's a wonderful life pre-tape was five minutes, 42 seconds, which is the longest pre-tape in six years. And then the Papyrus 2 is an entire minute longer. So that's what I mean of, was there ever a plan to get it in? Was it really just that things went a little long? Because that's the, that's the longest, would be the longest pre-tape by a whole minute in over six years. Yeah, that begs the question, were they expecting a breakout strain of COVID and the episode not to go forward live if they thought that they were going to be able to air? Because that's the, that's why the evening with Pete got on, right? They're, they they didn't have live sketches that night. Well, right? yeah, they, they, used, they used all the pre-tapes they had. They had like the home goods one with uh, AD and Kate. They had the Christmas shoes song with Kyle and Charlie XCX, and they had this really long pre-tape with Pete. So I've just always been curious about that. Are we just seeing pre-tapes get cut down later that were longer? Or was that one like they just had, okay, we're going to make room for a really long pre-tape? Because on this list, I looked at the longest pre-tapes since, you know, in the SNL stat era, which for me is season 44 to now. Papyrus 2 would have been number one. Evening with Pete would be number two at a whole minute less. Um, what up with that at home? They had all the time they needed, so that makes sense. 539. Also, uh, 5 minutes 37 was an at-home episode with the Zoom call. And then uh, Christmas Epiphany with Austin Butler, Keenan and Kelly with um, Kiki Palmer. Then the Christmas Socks, that one I just mentioned from the um, Paul Rudd episode. And then Shrimp Tower. So that's the average pre-tape is so much shorter than the live sketch. So for Papyrus 2 to be that long or evening with Pete from the Rudd episode to be that long, just, I have a lot of questions. (laughs) Gabby, do you have any thoughts on whether or not in the future we should maybe consider that to be like more canon that it was like mentioned during the show? Cause we have a lot of talks on this show about like what stats and what's not. So I just want to get your opinion before we stop. Yeah, I mean, I will say I was confused when I first saw it because I didn't remember uh, the original Papyrus and I was watching it with a friend and she like reminded me of it. I was like, oh, yeah, sure. And as she's like explaining what the sketch is, I'm just kind of like nodding along like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. (laughs) As I'm like going to pull it up. But I thought that it was phenomenal. Like you said, it was like a a short movie. I thought it was hilarious. Um, But I... I don't know if it's, I don't know. I feel like, yes, the show could, we would all love the sh- for the show to be longer, but it is that length, like for a reason, right? Like they've made it work for 49 seasons. I feel like maybe these longer things aren't necessarily necessary moving forward, even though it is enjoyable. Like if that was in the show as uh, like in the, in the allotted time, it would have taken away from some great breaking that we saw and some great sketches that we saw. So like, I kind of get 
weighing that balance of like, do we want more sketches that we think are pretty strong? Because I don't think, at least in my opinion, nothing was really that weak this uh, this episode. Um, so like, do we include everything that we want to, um, like the live sketches, or do we like make time for this super long pre-tape? So I, I get why they did it, but I'm just not sure that we need to do it and like keep doing it. Yeah, for me, I had like almost anxiety of like fear of change when I saw that. I'm like, <laughs> everything's going to be different now. Like, <laughs> we can't go back. Uh, just because I, I would hate for them to save anything for that just to drive internet numbers, even if it's a smart business decision. Sure. So if it's a case where, hey, we're making a short film for you to enjoy with or without SNL, but it's made by SNL with SNL, then I'm all for it. But if I'm just so curious about the game plan for Papyrus 2, knowing that the fans would be into it. But as uh, you just mentioned, that if some people might not have remembered it, and if you don't remember it at all, you might be like, what the hell is this sketch? Because there's no context if you had yeah. the original. <laughs> like I mentioned with Tiny Horse 2, if you didn't see the first one, I don't know what you would think about the second one. So Amanda, you looked like you had a strong take about whether or not this counts and i know for myself i was just kind of mad that i didn't get to do kyle mooney stats <laughs> oh yeah and and yeah yeah and kyle i was really happy to see kyle i thought kyle looked great i'm like kyle kyle's thriving now uh <laughs> no it's not canon that's crazy uh, it's not it can't be no, you can't, can't like be. sneak it in by like a reference to it and then it be if that's i i, I think that gabby Gabby put it well that the, you you have an hour and a half whatever with commercials and what you do it you know you have four days to pick what you're gonna slot in where and then see what happens and what it looks like and that's like the beauty of it and the magic of it you can't then if something's successful after the fact like you, you have to prioritize like that's what I think is so fun about the show it's like they have all this stuff some weeks they have too much stuff some weeks they don't have enough and they're borrowing from other weeks and like what are you going to do to fill that time? What are you prioritizing? And then we sit here and obsess over the decisions that were made behind the scenes, probably at four in the morning, you know, mm -hmm. and that that's how it works. You can't, I, I, it's not canon. It's not, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist and we can't enjoy it and we can't talk about it, but it's not canon. Yeah. I mean, you just verbatim my thoughts. And, <laughs> and also the entire reason that by the numbers exists is because I view it as a live sport where some people are going to be winners, some are losers as far as you worked so hard, whether the sketch makes it on or not, and you get the heartbreak of it being cut. And maybe it'll come back in the future, and maybe it won't. But that's the beauty of the live aspect of the show. And so that's why, you know, screen time, of course, I love it, but I don't, I'm not as interested in screen time for things that are already edited and cut down into like an hour and a half movie because it's all intentional. Whereas this, any episode we've seen this season could have looked completely different had they made different decisions, which is why the power ranking exists and why we do the screen time because it's so volatile backstage. It's so exciting and anything can happen. And so if they thought that Papyrus 2 at 6 minutes, 52, 42 seconds was worth it to make the live show, then it would be canon. So well said, Amanda. But yeah, I mean... You guys get me fired up about stats and what <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go off. So but it was so just, much fun talking to you guys. Gabby, go ahead. No, I was just saying, uh, to boil that all down, it's screen time. It's what's on your screen at the time of the show. Right. <laughs> it's not what's on YouTube after. <laughs> Someone had to say it. <laughs> I mean, but that's crazy, though, that they, like, how long did that take them to make that? Right. Yeah. They, prior they prioritize a large chunk of their week. To, to make that, which is insane. I, I thought Sarah was really good uh, in that. And I like when Sarah plays kind of normal. I, I think it's fun. Um, really good sketch. Really glad that we saw it. Not canon. <laughs> Too bad. I'm glad it exists, though. Yeah, so yeah. I'll take a pre-tape online anytime as long as it wasn't intentionally for that. So if it's a long film, you know, Back in the day, season one, episode one, you know, filmed by Albert Brooks, it would take up a lot of time, but they they budgeted for that. So they had multiple musical guests the first episode. They did a lot of different things. They had the Muppets on, on set. Like, so there's so many different ways that SNL has evolved, and we just have to accept that this could be the future. 
and maybe I fear change, but I'm also <laughs> excited by, by it. So Gabby, thank you so much. You're just such an insightful SNL mind oh, and I love hearing you. your thoughts on it. So <laughs> please come back to the show and tell the listeners anything you want to and before we say good night. Um, hello and good night and thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you for talking. Amanda, what about yeah. you? Uh, what about me? <laughs> yeah. anything, anything to say? You can't find me anywhere. This happens every time. Um, thank you for having us on. It's fun. Our little lawyers night on the podcast. <laughs> um, and I want to say that I can't think of, I can't talk about endearing breaking without talking about Pete Davidson, who broke for a solid six and a half seasons uh, straight. Okay. And I, that man can do anything he wants. So yeah. Gabby's point that it's okay. If yeah, you like, there you person. go. <laughs> Pete Davidson can do anything he wants. You heard it here first. So <laughs> you can quote her. <laughs> yep. I've, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Yeah. Love of your life. <laughs> so once again, we are presentation of late night.com. So many thanks to the folks at that site. Um, I check it out. It's awesome. So uh, we can find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, X. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, of course, with the regular schedule. But in the meantime, there's an SNL stories brewing that I think you're going to be really excited about. So can't say anything about it, but I can't wait to hear it. So for Gabby, Amanda, I am Mike Murray of the SNN. Can't wait to be back for three more shows for the summer. So have a good night, everybody. We will see you.